Elon Musk spoon-fed you his cherry-picked information, which you must have suspected promotes a slanted viewpoint, or at the very least generates another right-wing conspiracy theory. This isn't just a matter of what data was given to these so-called journalists before us now. My name is Matt Taibbi. I'm not a so-called journalist. I've won the National Magazine Award, the IF Stone Award for Independent Journalism, and I've written 10 books, including four New York Times bestsellers. <laughs> Before Matt Taibbi was sparring with Democratic members of Congress on Capitol Hill earlier this year over the Twitter files, he was a darling of the progressive left, appearing regularly on shows like Democracy Now!, Bill Moyers, and Rachel Maddow. Matt Taibbi, his new article for Rolling Stone magazine, Why Isn't Wall Street in Jail? The Bush administration, these are some of the people, these are some of the greatest liars in the history of politics. And even they couldn't come up with a connection between Al-Qaeda and, and Saddam Hussein. Though he was always a fierce critic of the Democratic establishment, the rise of Donald Trump suddenly meant that anyone nominally left of center, even progressive journalists like Taibbi, were expected to support Hillary Clinton unconditionally. So when he attacked her as a sellout, argued that the Russiagate narrative was mostly bullshit and equated the manipulative tactics of both right and left media personalities, he found himself cold-shouldered by progressives. And Democrats started treating him like a puppet for the right. Do you think it's a legitimate objective of the FBI to stop foreign interference in our elections? I think it's a legitimate objective to stop actual foreign interference. Okay. I mean, I don't know what the difference is, but that's fine. In 2020, Taibbi started publishing his work on Substack and quickly became one of the platform's most popular writers, earning far more revenue than he ever did at Rolling Stone. You yourself posted on your, your um, I guess it's kind of like a web page. I don't quite understand what Substack is, but. He became even more of a pariah by publishing exhaustive reports that documented extensive governmental interference, seeking to control what was said on Twitter about COVID-19 and efforts by Russia to influence U.S. elections. Congressional Democrats pilloried him as a fake journalist, a Putin apologist, and a stooge for Elon Musk. It's quite obvious that you've profited from the Twitter files. I Very think simple. it's probably a wash, honestly. Nope. Then you consider Mr. Musk to be the direct source of all this. No, now you're you're trying to get me to say that he is the source. I, 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 well, I just can't answer your question. Well, he either is or he isn't. Source. He's yeah, a well, journalist. Well, he can't because either Musk is the source and he can't talk about it, or Musk is not the source. And if Musk is not the source, then he can discuss. No his one has yielded. The gentle lady's out of order. You don't. But what he has said is he's not going to reveal his source, and the I fact that Democrats are pressuring to him to do so is such a We're asking him about his conversation. Reason caught up with Taibbi at Freedom Fest an annual gathering held this year in Memphis to talk about the new challenges to free speech, why legacy media is dying, and how identity politics are poisoning political discourse. Matt Taibbi, thanks for talking to Reason. It's so great to talk to you again, Nick. Uh, so let's talk about the Twitter files first. When you went into the you know, kind of sealed room and things like that. What were you expecting to find? Not much. Um, I went into the Twitter files with a very old school, um, antiquated kind of First Amendment conception of what we might find or, you know, or what questions we might answer. Uh, we discussed with uh, Twitter's management the idea of focusing on the suppression of the Hunter Biden story, mainly because um, Mark Zuckerberg had given an interview uh, and had testified before Congress right. in which he suggested that um, the FBI had tipped him off about that story. So I thought if there were those kinds of communications with Twitter, this might be where we found them. Uh, and I wanted to know what those communications look like. Uh, as we discovered there, we, we didn't find them in that case, but we found an enormous quantity of, of, quantity of them elsewhere, and it turned into a much more complicated story than I anticipated. Does it, I mean, like, does the Twitter files really, uh, is it the final nail in the coffin of the idea that there is a clean distinction between the government and the media? You know, because that kind of informed for a long time you know, if you if you think back to like the Pentagon Papers or something, it's like, well, the New York Times 
is separate from the government and it's not communicating in the way that it seemed like you know in the twitter files it's like there are tons of people at twitter saying hey fbi or whatever take a look at this and then various government actors are saying hey you really need to look at this and do something about it i would say that it, it puts the final nail in the coffin of that narrative i actually feel guilty for being naive about that mm -hmm. um, Again, I grew up in the media. My father was, you know, in television, and I was around newsrooms most of my childhood. The idea that the FBI might call up and say, hey, you might want to think about not doing this story, that would be crazy. I, can't, yeah. I, I couldn't have even imagined an editor or a news director who would have even taken that call, right. uh, you know, in that way. And we found in the Twitter files all kinds of things that suggested that this relationship was not only uh, tolerated, but that it was ongoing, regular, um, and collusive in a way that was kind of shocking to me. I think what, the what's a specific example of that? A, a great example of this was the, um, the Aspen Institute tabletop ex exercise, which was technically not set up by the government. Uh, it, it was set up by the Aspen Institute, which is funded by the government in collaboration with some um, academic institutions that had been briefed by the FEC and some government agencies. But they all got together uh, before the release of the Hunter Biden story. They were briefed by current and former government officials um, who talked about the possibility uh, that a hack and leak story involving Hunter Biden and Burisma might come out, and they kind of war game the possibility of what to do about that story. And then a month later, that story happens. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, if I had been in that room and that story actually happened a month later, I would feel obligated to do a story about that tabletop exercise. I would say, hey, what a weird coincidence that this thing happened. But these people had you know, an off the record arrangement with everybody they were in the room with and they um, they kept to it, they kept quiet. And, you know, that's a completely new level of cooperation yeah. and coordination that, you know, I would never have imagined and, possible. And I mean, what did, I guess, did it work or did it not to suppress the story? Because that, I mean, this is a slightly different question. Like, was it a Streisand effect where, you know, the New York Post publishes something about Hunter Biden a couple of weeks before the election and people are like, yeah, you know, it's the New York Post. But then I remember like going to Twitter when I heard about it and then it was like you can't link to it from Twitter or anything. And that was really chilling. Like that was the first time I felt I was in like an Orwell novel or something mm -hmm. where it's like, what do you mean? Like you can't you can't link to it or discuss it on Twitter. But, you know, I mean, do you think did it work first? And then let's talk about like why they thought it might or might not have. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think that would be worth studying. Yeah. It would, it would be interesting to do some surveys about that and find out um, what the actual impact of that was. Uh, I think overall in the long run, certainly that story got more attention um, than it would have absent this. However, um, we're also learning, uh, you know, I think there's more about that story that's going to come out uh, what fairly mean? soon. My understanding is that there are some depositions that are on, uh, underway, that there are things that are happening in Washington where um, some of those committees, uh, you know, that are oversight committees are still looking at that mm -hmm. issue and the stuff that was on the laptop. Because we didn't know a whole lot when that first right. story came out. All we knew was that they found the laptop. They didn't know a whole lot about whether any of those emails were meaningful. Um, all we knew is that we had some some racy looking pictures. It was embarrassing. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to take some hardcore investigation to, to find out whether there's anything behind that. And that process, in many cases, takes years. I would just say they probably were effective in stalling that. Yeah. You know? um, also, there's the alternate... Um, story where they told people in mainstream uh, media that this was Russian disinformation. And I think that was effective with Biden voters. Like that story um, had an effect. 
in getting people to ignore the idea that this was anything worth paying attention to. You, I mean, you obviously kind of started your career in Russia, you know, in, in the post-Soviet uh, world. Was this kind of collusion between the government and news, was that taken for granted there? I mean, is this, are we looking like, you know, Russia and I don't know, you know, in the late 90s or something? Yeah, like 1999, 2000, I think that was when you first started to see directly, um, you know, the news stations resembling um, basically press releases for the Kremlin. In the, in the mid to late Yeltsin years, the press was sort of stratified and fractured. Each of the different news companies was, was basically backed by a different mob in, uh, or mafia interest. Um, and they all had their own ties to Yeltsin, but basically you were looking at the point of view of this or that oligarch when you watched the news. When Putin came to power, one of the first things he did is he really consolidated the media landscape. Um, he cracked down on um, companies like NTV, which is one of the last independent stations, and he got it so that there was basically no dissent in Russian media. And it's beginning to feel a little bit like that. It Although it's press. it's not because like if you, you know, if if you descend from you know Biden, you're going to start eating polonium without knowing it, right? So right. Yes. can you discuss the like what are the steps that are happening, you know? And it's not like against the media's interest or, or, or against media actors. They're like bringing it on. And Twitter and Facebook was filled with people who had been in an administration, then moved there to do like. Uh, you know, communications or strategy, and it goes back and forth. Like, how are we getting to a place where Twitter, which, you know, its first big glory was in helping to uh, kind of platform the Arab Spring. And like, mm -hmm. it, was gonna, it was great because it was anti-government and it was anti-censorship. And now it's, you know, fucking like doing the, the, it's, you know, the towel boy for a particular vision. I don't want to say the deep state, but like, of a centrist kind of mainstream ideological politics. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Um, there's obviously a huge difference yeah. between what happened in Russia. I mean, I I knew people like Anna Politkovskaya who you know got murdered yeah. um, under the Putin regime. There were a couple of others I knew who had had some pretty unfortunate fates. Nobody's getting shot in their doorway, right. you know, in the United States. But that's actually one of the more depressing parts about our story is that this is all voluntary, what's going yeah. on. Um, the overall, the overarching narrative that we um, collectively uh, working on the Twitter files decided uh, was happening was that there was a huge um, infrastructure that had been built up for counterproliferation, counterterrorism within the government. Um, it was aimed at the messaging apparatus of groups like ISIS um, to prevent, uh, you know, the successful recruitment of white kids in suburban England and California. Well, when, you know, that threat dissipated, they moved over to populism in the United States and, because, as you say, Twitter, which um, had been this incredible force for you know, anarchy and the, you know, the um, irrepressible political urges of the population in the Arab Spring, it kind of came out again with Trump. I mean, Trump bypassed the, the uh, ordinary media in 2016, and his um, amazing insight was that I can just use my own Twitter account and I'll have much more reach than all of these different stations combined. And I think that freaked out a lot of people in power. And, and what we saw in the Twitter files essentially was a long um, period of rollback, uh, which they achieved through various different means. Did they do that? And I realize you, you may not be in a position to uh, know, but like, did they do that against the wishes of people like Jack Dorsey and the top kind of creators of Twitter? You know, because there's one narrative, which is that what's going wrong in kind of social media companies, it's not the people at the top or who started it, but it's like mid-level managers who are all like, you know what, we are good liberal slash progressives. And, you know, we're really scared of like America. And so we are going to censor people. And, you know, Dorsey and these other guys are kind of walking around the C-suite like Howard Hughes. They don't, 
and they they're like, oh, you know, I, we don't have any power. I mean, who was who made these kind of operative decisions? It's funny. Um, before the first Twitter files, I had one fairly senior Twitter executive joke to me that Jack Dorsey was more like the company's spirit animal than its CEO. Yeah. Um, I had talked to Jack before. I I, I like him. Yeah. I think he's. Uh, at heart, uh, got a lot of sympathy for uh, free speech principles. I think they're yeah. important to him. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the Twitter files, you see that he's not in the loop of a lot of these key decisions. Uh, the things that happened, uh, particularly around that one incident um, involving the Hunter Biden story, he was definitely not involved in that. Uh, one of the weird ways that I know about that is because I, I found, believe it or not, uh, on my first day looking at the Twitter files that Jack Dorsey had forwarded to Vijaya God, the woman who was basically running things, um, one of my articles complaining about um, uh, you know, the, the censorship of that article. He was definitely a free speech advocate, but he was not, um, he, he really wasn't at the helm. When they came to the decision to take Trump off the platform, um, you know, I, I think he was dragged kicking and screaming to that decision, and uh, most of the company was was against him at that point. Yeah, um, with the uh, kind of Russia Gate, or you know, the Russia Gate narrative is that the Russians wanted, and correct me, or, or you know, massage this into what you believe. You know, is that Russia was proactive? They wanted Trump to win, and they were going to end. More than that, it was also that the Trump campaign was actively working with them. Um, and that seemed, is that like the hinge point of like, we're going to look back and there's like media before 2016 and after. And how did, how did the Russiagate story spin out? Because, I mean, there have been tons of congressional investigations and others. And like, they've really come up with nothing in terms of collusion. Right. So why is it, you know, why did it get started? And then why is it persisting after like, you know, just we got nothing except, you know, wish or a dream, a desire that it's true. Well, the Russiagate story, oddly enough, became um, sort of involuntarily uh, very important in my life personally. I think it's really the reason I ended up leaving mainstream media um, where I was very happy. I had a, a you had the job everybody wanted, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, who who doesn't want to be the campaign reporter for Rolling Stone right. magazine, right? It's like the coolest thing in the world. It's one of the iconic gigs you can have. Um, but when the uh, the Rush Kid story happened, as you mentioned, there were really two different storylines. One was that Russia had interfered somehow, and they had a couple of different inflection points that they were looking at. There was the hack. Um, then there was working with WikiLeaks and you know some other things, uh, but the more important narrative that I thought um, they were pushing was this idea of collusion, and I never saw anything that indicated anything like hard proof for that. And um, I, at first, all I said, I wrote a couple of very gentle columns in the beginning saying. This looks a little bit like the WMD mistake, right. where we have an awful lot of anonymous um, state officials who are telling us things that we can't reproduce in the laboratory independently. Like, there's no way to check this story, right? But everybody was going for it, and I think you know it's as simple as people thought everything was permitted in pursuit of getting rid of Donald Trump. I mean, there was a very influential article in the New York Times in August of 2016 called uh, Trump is Testing the Norms of Objectivity in Journalism. And uh, the columnist Jim Rutenberg argued, we can't just be true anymore. We have to be true to history's judgment. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and that's also great where Trump was, uh, you know, it's just so weird. Like everybody's like, he is destroying norms. Therefore, we are going to throw over our norms pro uh, preemptively <laughs> right. to get rid of him. And it's like, okay, yeah, whatever. I mean, it, like, it worked great in Iraq, right? Preemptive war, preemptive war against Trump has worked out pretty well. 
it, 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 it's like they're incapable of learning anything, you know, from any of these mistakes. And, and with the Russiagate thing, it was like it was happening in slow motion the, the entire yeah. time. I mean, they kept stepping in it one story after another. And instead of walking it back or, um, you know, re-examining the evidence, yeah. uh, they would double down. They would say, what okay. did, I realize this is, you know, asking to psychologize, but like, why was, why were mainstream people, and, and it's, you know, mostly it's kind of like liberal, centrist liberals, uh, legacy media types, but also, you know, I don't know, like people in newer publications, like they wanted that to be true. And it, it was like, I'm old enough to remember reruns of I Dream of Jeannie or like <laughs> Free's Company, where it's like every week Mr. Roper is finally going to catch Jack Tripper in a homosexual tryst. And then Billy it never Gibson happens. Island, they're going to get off. Yeah, and like, you know, Dr. Bellows is, get, you know, this time he's got Tony down to rights. And it's like it never happened. And you would think 15 times in, you'd be like, yeah, maybe I, you know, let's write a different plot. Right, right, exactly. You still enjoy the show, though. That's yeah, the that's thing. true. That's true. Yeah, right? yeah. And and um, you know, and they're still doing it, right? They, they are still doing it. Uh, if you go back and look, yeah. you can see why it was compelling television. Yeah. You can see why MSNBC shot to the top of the ratings for the first yeah. time in twenty years. Uh, this looked like you know the end of the world. This was the Millerite prediction, yeah. you know of. You know, the world was going to come to the, to an end and it was going to happen on live TV and you better not turn it off because, you know, it might happen while we're on the air. Right. They would even do, if you watch the, the tosses between one show to another, um, they would sort of guide you from one show to the next and warn you that you better not turn the dial because between Lawrence O'Donnell and Rachel, it might happen, you know? And um, this was very compelling TV. I mean, I, yeah. I, I understand yeah, yeah. why they did it, but the problem was, you know, you, you were setting yourself up, you were writing checks that you were gonna have to cash at some point. And, you know, that's a very dangerous place to be. I mean, one of the things I always liked about journalism is that when you're done with the story, it's done, you're, you know, you go to sleep and you don't have to think about it anymore. This thing was like the sword of Damocles like hanging over the whole business. And I, I don't understand what people were thinking. I know a lot of the old timers yeah. were, were very worried about it, but. But they're kind of all gone, they're right? Kind of, they're all yeah. gone, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, with the, is, you know, does, what's interesting is that Russiagate was primarily among liberals who, you know, and none of this, I guess, is true, but like during the Cold War, it was like, well, the conservatives were the real Americans and they understood that the Soviet Union and, and you know, by extension, the Russian people were evil and you can't really do business with evil. And the liberals were more like, no, you know, we have to work peacefully. And now it's weird because it's liberals who are like Russia, 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 like they're evil. And now we have conservatives who are like, you know, Putin, you know, give Putin a chance or something like uh, you know, how do, how do you explain like these weird flips? It's like, you know, what, every million years or something that the North and South Pole flip. <laughs> right. And then you, but then it feels like, okay, it's always been this way. Like, where is that coming from? Well, I originally thought it was because I had gone crazy. Like yeah. that something was wrong with me personally. I think that was a common experience of a lot of people. Like, it must be me. Like this, this must all make sense somewhere. Um, outside of my understanding. But if you look back, I can't remember which one of them said it. I feel like it's either Jim Clapper or Ted Lieu. But there was a prominent politician who said something like, the Russian is genetically predisposed to deceive or something like that. And like th This was a comment a politician made and, and it flew all over social media and it wasn't condemned. It was like, you know, sort of upheld. Um, and again, as you say, back in the Soviet days, one of the principal liberal um, ideas was that you know the the Russian person is not guilty. It's, right. It's their there leader. was the Sting song, you know, Russian mothers love their children too. Or right. right. Exactly. Yeah, that yeah. was that was Sting, and yeah. um, you know, Richard Pryor said, you know, hey, if you don't have that hat on, I don't know. Who, I don't know. I mean, the Russian don't have the hat on. I don't know who the fuck he is. Yeah. Right. Right. Like, right. They're, like they're just people just like us. Yeah. Um, that all went out the window when this started. And why? I have no idea. Um, you, let's talk a little bit about leaving Rolling Stone. Uh, when, when did you leave exactly? 
Uh, I guess I left in 2019. Right, and you you went to Substack immediately. You were one of the original people, which also was fascinating when Substack started, and then when it came out, they were paying some people. Mm -hmm. Then there was like again from kind of legacy media or like cub reporters who were pissed they weren't getting 200 grand advances. We're like, that's wrong. Like, why should people be paid to do independent journalism? <laughs> right? It was bizarre, but. What led to the rupture with Rolling Stone? Because like you were saying, I mean, you know, that what a great position to be in. Um, you know, it's a it's a coveted slot. Rolling Stone, it's weird because, yeah, what, it started in 67, um, but it quickly became like mainstream publication, mainstream journalism. What led to the rupture there? Yeah, first of all, I love Rolling Stone. I, I'll always have a soft spot in my heart for it. I think it had um, a couple of, really long heydays mm -hmm. where it did unbelievable work. Yeah. Um, it was great as music journalism for a long time. It, it was innovative in bringing it, um, Hunter Thompson's style of writing uh, to political journalism. And I think you know that's become iconic now, right? right. Uh, they brought P.G. O'Rourke in. Yeah. Uh, then the, you know, when I was there in the early 2000s uh, and mid-2000s, the owner, Jan Wenner, um, was absolutely against a lot of the stuff that I wrote uh, because I was reporting on financial corruption that didn't look good for the Democratic Party um, sometimes. But he was cool with it. He's, you know, it, that was a rare thing. Like in journalism, it's not often when your boss says, I hate this, but go for it. You know, um, that's what makes a magazine great. And but that started to change. I think after Trump, everybody's tolerance for um, you know sort of exploring different points of view kind of dried up and I didn't leave because I was pressured or pushed out the door it was really more um, that I had a sense that there was something more lucrative and more rewarding out there oh, yeah. on, on the inter independent front um, so are you making more money on Substack than you were for Rolling Stone a lot more yes. really can you say how much more like I don't want to say it. How, I, how, make I, us all feel bad, not just me, but the camera guys. For Let's just say that I'm making many times over more than I was making at Rolling Stone. Yeah. What, do you, what accounts for that? I mean, part of it is Substack. I mean, the code they kind of cracked was allowing people to be able to easily monetize an audience, right? But, you know, what, I mean, how, how do you account for like the idea? So basically what you showed, and you know, I think Matt Iglesias leaving Vox has done this. Um, I think Glenn Greenwald, it's interesting since he started The Intercept and then was like, God, I hate this place. And the feelings were mutual. But like when you get to a place where a writer like you somehow, if you're making, you know, I don't know, five times what you were making at Rolling Stone, you were carrying a ton of people at Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. um, like what, what's the appeal? do you think, like for you, Unbound? Well, there was a couple of things. One, um, any writer who's ever worked for editors, and I've yeah. benefited massively from the editors yeah. I've had, like, you know, Will Dana, Eric Bates. Right. I had great editors at Rolling Stone. And, um, you know, I, I would never say that they're bad for a writer. Right. But there is something to be said for when you turn 50, um, and you want to write what you want to write about, uh, yeah. and there's nobody to say no, that feels pretty good, and sometimes that comes out in the writing too. Yeah. By the Do way, do you are you edited now, or is it like, I mean, or just copy editing or something? Uh, yeah, we do copy editing. Sometimes yeah. we do fact checking. It depends yeah. on what kind of piece it is. Because I mean, it's fast. I, I totally, and I'm ten years older, I think, than you are uh, roughly. So I get that, but it's also I as an editor, I like, yeah, you know, my best work was done when I had to explain myself to a pre-reader on some level. Right. Right. There is some of that, you know, I mean, like on, on one level, yes, I would love to be writing, working with an editor, um, but you know, A, it's an expense. B, um, there's a speed element now to uh, internet publishing that is new. Yeah. Um, even a delay of an hour uh, can be consequential in how, in, um, how well a piece does, and that, that's, that's different. So, how do you describe your audience? like? Um, you know your your Substack subscribers. Like, can you give kind of a psychographic of them? What you know? Who are the people who are reading you and paying you? You know, gratefully out of their own pockets. You know, 
tons of dollars. Yeah, so my overall list, which includes the non-paying people, I mean, it's, you know, it's around 400,000, 400 something thousand um, subscribers now. And it's funny, originally, um, I would say they were all sort of center lefty uh, people who knew me from Rolling Stone. But now this is a very diverse uh, audience that I have. I have hardcore Trump supporters. I have uh, lots and lots of independents who are like disaffected hippies from the 60s who are, who are full of you know, anger about what's happened to the Democratic Party. Um, I have libertarians. I have people who, uh, you know, have never been a part of any political movement. It's really interesting, actually, because at Rolling Stone, my audience was at, was relatively hom homogenous. Yeah. Um, and that's not the case here. How um, you you mentioned Jan Wenner, you know, who is kind of like a archetypal baby boomer, right? Mm -hmm. And a late '60s boomer, who among other things was, you know, one of those guys who, you know, is like, I'm in favor of free speech, no matter what. Um, one of your most recent pieces, or, you know, and like if you read the headlines of your subsect of, like one is, where have all the liberals gone? Another is, get off the First Amendment's lawn. Uh, why Julian Assange must be freed. The elite war on free thought. Like, something has happened among people who broadly call themselves liberals or progressives, where generationally, up through probably Gen X, that was like, if not the most important issue, like free speech, Uber Allah is, then it was like in the top three. For younger people, maybe it, it doesn't seem to be as important. Um, do you agree with that? And if so, what do you think has shifted that younger people who are liberal and progressive may have the exact same political commitments as you, or like free speech is, is more of a problem than it is a solution? I'm less in tune with what's going on with people who are under 30 and... How old are you right now? I'm 53. Okay. Yeah. Um, in my generation growing up, uh, I didn't know anybody who wasn't relatively a free speech absolutist, right? right. Like everybody I knew supported Frank Zappa and Dee Snyder and the against yeah. the Parents Music Resource Center. We were all in favor of NWA when they, you know... Every one of those controversies that you knew yeah, two were two live crew. Yeah, like, yeah, two live crew. The even the tape delay for Richard Pryor when he went yeah. on Saturday Night Live, right? Stuff like that. Um, it was automatic. It was a defining issue for for a generation. Um, but there, I think, has been a schism, you know, within former liberals. Uh, it's. It's clear to me between boomers and Gen Xers like me. You know, I mean, you brought up Jan Wenner. There was actually a moment at Rolling Stone that I think was kind of significant, where um, in the primary season uh, for 2016, Jan did a big official Rolling Stone editorial supporting Hillary Clinton, yeah. and I was a little bit shocked by that, given the, the magazine's history. Yeah. And I went to Jan personally, I said, hey, would you mind if I wrote a dissenting editorial? And I wrote one in favor of Bernie. And Jan's whole um, idea there was that the world has changed since uh, 1972. George McGovern got beat. Um, we were wrong then. Yeah. Um, we have to win now, and winning is the most important thing. And so forget about idealism and all that stuff we cared about in the 60s and 70s and, every, and all that. I mean, I thought, this is supposed to be a magazine for young people, theoretically. Right, like, right. you know, how is that yeah. going to fly? But it did, you know? Um, and I, I was a little bit surprised by um, the reaction to both my editorial and his. That's fascinating that he, as a boomer, is like, yeah, free speech, oh, you know, we can leave it. Um, because... Clearly, younger generations seem less enamored of that. And that's, I mean, one of the things I think about people, uh, you know, squarely on the progressive left, like you, uh, Tom Frank, Thomas Frank, mm -hmm. Glenn Greenwald, et cetera, like you've all over the past few years have articulate, you know, broken with identity politics. Can you talk a little bit about that? And again, in terms of policy commitments, I don't know that you're that different, but 
you know, why don't identity politics resonate with you? I don't believe a lot of the identity politics that are being proffered by the current version of the Democratic Party are genuine. And my first uh, experience with this, where I really, really thought about this, was when I was following Bernie Sanders' campaign in 2016. And there was a moment in that campaign where he first started to really draw blood against Hillary. Right. Um, you might remember it was like in February uh, or late January of 2016. He was hammering her on her ties to Goldman Sachs and other banks. The New York Post, interestingly, did this, um, published this big list of all of her speech commitments, and it was kind of amazing. And she wouldn't release the transcripts, right? She wouldn't release speech, the yeah. transcripts, but. Um, I mean, even the schedule was amazing. She was doing three hundred thousand dollars in the morning, and then flying to someplace and doing four hundred grand. Gestad or something, yeah, yeah exactly, to right. Inner circle of the Bilderbergers or whatever. And they tried everything to hit back, and nothing worked until she said, "If we break up the banks tomorrow, will that end racism?" Yeah. And Bernie was paralyzed by that. You yeah. know, Bernie's an old school. Um, He's a real commie. I mean, and I, I mean that like where it's class and everything else is a distraction, right? That, you know, you know, you, you know, capitalists will use race in order to keep the workers from realizing, no, they're all on the same side. Well, uh, I, I would say I almost wish he was that yeah. beca because, you know, Bernie also marched in, you know, in, in, yeah. for a civil rights movement in the 60s. And he was terrified of the idea yeah. that he might be accused of race, racism. Right. It, it mortified him, and I think it really slowed his campaign down. Yeah, I, there was also that moment, I think it might have been in Seattle or something, where he was almost literally pushed off the stage mm -hmm. by a couple of black activists who were like, we need to be talking about racial concerns, not whatever he was talking about. Right, not your class thing, whatever that is, right? And that, and that was when they started to um, sort of demonize the white working class, right, right? which is a brilliant strategic move. Yeah. Also, in interestingly, it, it was the exact opposite of what the Clintons had done yeah. in the 90s. You know, the Clintons' whole strategy was, let's peel off a little bit of that white working class yeah, vote. And we feel their pain. We feel their pain, right? Yeah. And, and that's, you know, they just got over the finish line doing that. And now they... Um, so we can add to the sins of Hillary Clinton that she also injected identity politics. I think so. I think, I think that was a conscious thing that they did. Yeah. Um, you, that they, nothing was working for them. I mean, if you, if you read those books, there, one, one of the books about the Hillary campaign, there's a hilarious chapter where they couldn't come up with a slogan because they didn't even know what they stood for. Like they were, they were toying with, it's her turn, you know? <laughs> um, and, but this, you know, this whole idea of identity politics being something that they could lord over somebody like Bernie, right. who was, you know, a legitimately an oppositional movement and who was drawing on this anger, the same anger that Trump was, um, you know, it worked. It stopped him in his tracks. Um, the, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about uh, Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, Hillary hated Julian Assange because she, uh, among other things, felt embarrassed by him, you know, with the first big WikiLeaks dump, uh, you know, from Chelsea Manning. Uh, you know, and on from that, how do you, how do you make sense of journalists who actually don't think that Julian Assange should be like free to walk the planet? I mean, it's it, it, stunning because these are always the same people are like, you know, the, the New York Times and the Washington Post were so brave, you know, pushing back against the Vietnam War, or publishing the Pentagon Papers. Yeah. And, and even publishing Assange at one yeah. point, yeah. right? Um, I remember doing um, public service announcements with other journalists. Uh, I did one that was, um, you know, where everybody had to stand up and say, I am Bradley Manning. It was Bradley yeah, Manning right. back then. Uh, but there were a whole lot of people in the media business in, in that public service announcement because everybody at that time believed that of course this is right. You know, we're, we're exposing war crimes. What could be wrong with that? Yeah, and the, there was no question that the, the files were true, like the information was accurate. 
nobody had any, uh, there's never been an issue of factuality, I don't, not that I know of with, with WikiLeaks. There are some other ethical issues that I, you know, I think are legitimate, but with factuality, no. But the amazing thing about the reaction that journalists have had since the indictment is the total inability to, to see how this relates to the future of journalism. I mean, they're threatening this guy with 175 years in prison for doing basically the same thing that every national security journalist does every day. Um, you know, they're talking about uh, conspiracy to um, retain national defense information or uh, obtaining national de defense information. Well, that happens all the time. I mean, you, you, this stuff doesn't even have to be classified, but we hear classified things all the time when we do reporting. If that's going to be a crime you can go to jail for 10 years for, and they're going to enforce that, how can you do reporting anymore? And everybody's all for it. Does that disappear if Trump disappears? I mean, is this all kind of an epiphenomenon of Trump is so uniquely awful, and you know, and you have people, Hunter Thompson, Actually, I guess said this more with George W. Bush, but that like, you know, Nixon was bad. Nixon, you know, the scumbag of the universe was bad, but George W. Bush is really bad. And I mean, is it just, I mean, I don't know, is it like old manism or something where it's like Nixon was bad, but Trump is the end of the world. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the Obama administration didn't feel like it had the juice to indict um, Assange as much as they wanted to. Right. Um, but that after... Trump got elected. Ironically enough, it was Trump's own Justice Department that did it. But you know, politically, there was a lot of support for that after this story in 2016 about you know uh, WikiLeaks possibly working with the Russians. Again, legally, it doesn't matter because right. the case is about an earlier time period. Yeah. People don't think that way anymore, though. Um, so, but I think you're right. I think I think it, absent Trump. There, this wouldn't be happening. But uh, will Trump ever go away then? Or is the threat of the next Trump enough to kind of, you know, keep huffing this type of anti First Amendment or like where free speech is, free speech is negotiable now going forward? I think one of the main things and we found in the Twitter files was that if it's not Trump, it's something. There's yeah. always demon X that um, they're warning audiences away from, and they always come up with a word that is sort of a non-negotiable code for threat. So it's anti-vaxxer, right? Or domestic violent extremist or insurrectionist or anything, you know, something along those lines. Trump, in that sense, I think has been an, an, an enormous boon to the intelligence services. Um, they've been able to say, hey, if you, if you code as somebody who sides with Trump, um, you know, essentially, they've created um, what I like to call like the sort of one villain theory of the universe, which is if you're on Trump's side, that means you're on Putin's side, which means you're also on Assad's side, you're on Orban's side, you're on the side of domestic violence. And G somehow will end up in that mix too, right? Exactly. It's all connected. It's like right? an edible arrangement, right? I mean, you can just keep adding flavors or something. Yeah. And rationally, it's a crazy conspiracy theory, but um, they actually do... Uh, denialist and ban and, and de-amplify people based on ideas like that. Uh, so. um, you know, we're talking in uh, Memphis where Freedom Fest is. You're speaking there. RFK Jr., Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is speaking. Um, one of the things that's interesting about RFK, we reason has talked to him and we've critiqued him and all of this, but he self-consciously says he is following a lot of Trump's playbook. Like he, you know, he... I, I saw an interview with him where he said, you know, he misunderstood Trump's appeal. He was very anti-Trump, but like th now he's starting to understand why people looked at Trump seriously and he wants to kind of grab some of that. What, you know, what is going on? Like, why do people like Trump and now RFK Jr.? What, what are they giving to people that they're not getting out of traditional candidates? I don't think it's that big of a mystery. I mean, the, the very first time that I saw Trump in person, I remember having the thought 20 minutes into his speech, this is gonna work. 
Yeah. I mean, I didn't know if he was going to win, um, but what he was doing was scoring. You could feel it in the audience. And w why was that? Well, America, since 2008 especially, um, had become incredibly dysfunctional. We had had a, a massive financial collapse where the uh, elite and wealthy class had been completely bailed out when a lot of them should have gone to jail. Um, and everybody else sort of paid the bill, including millions of people who got thrown out of their homes, you know, in some cases justifiably, but in some cases not. And you add that to the, you know, the ongoing wars in the Middle East. There were lots of vets in Trump's crowds, you know, who had gripes about all kinds of things. Um, yeah. And Trump picked up on anger at institutional America that I think had a legitimate basis. And if you've read Martin Gurry's book, yeah, The yeah. Revolt of the Public, he predicted this before Trump came on the scene. And he said, people are going to be pissed about all these different things. And all it takes is somebody who's tuned into that. And my only uh, concern about Trump was that he was going to promise a lot but not really deliver. He was going to be a fake reformer. So if somebody were to come along and be a, you know, a real reformer, if they were actually going to try to do something about some of these things, that would probably have a lot of appeal to the public. Do you think RFK is that person? I think he's more honest than Donald Trump. I think um, you know the, the people that he surrounded himself with are real politicians. I think they actually care about um, a lot of these issues. Trump, for me, was a master at the appearance side of the game, right? right. He was just so good at visual politics and um, virality and all these things that people didn't understand very well back then. But he wasn't a policy wonk. He wasn't yeah. staying up at night reading position papers. Um, you know, with Kennedy, it's still unknown, I would say, you know, what, how sincere he is, what, what he's really up to. I think we have to get to know him a little bit better. Um, with, you know, he's also coming onto the scene post-COVID, um, you know, and Trump occupied a weird space during COVID, mm -hmm. right? Because it was kind of like, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I have experts, um, but, you know, uh, he was criticized for not implementing a single policy which in the end may have been better. But then he also, you know, he did Operation Warp Speed, which actually worked to get vaccines out quickly. They didn't come quick before the election, which he's obviously still pissed about. But he's also kind of an anti-vaxxer. How if 2008 was a moment where like, OK, you know, American institutions, people are like, fuck it, we're, you know, these, these, these are not working for us. How much worse is it post-COVID, do you think? I think it's a lot worse post-COVID. COVID has added to the dynamic that 2008, Iraq, yeah. um, WMDs, all that stuff. Even the 2000 election where we couldn't really decide. Yeah, that too, right? You add that on top of it. But COVID has a whole long list of things that have added to middle America's grievances, beginning with the fact that it, it it increasingly looks like they lied to us about the origins of the disease um, for some pretty weak reasons, maybe. Um, you know, they were trying to cover up some research they were doing. Uh, that's thing one um, that's looking increasingly likely. At the very least, they excluded the possibility of that um, illegitimately. And that, used, I mean, that was where the government was telling Twitter and Facebook at all, like, don't run this stuff or, or squelch it. Right, exactly. Squelch that. Um, then there was, you know, this whole idea of tying anti-vaccine um, sentiment to anti-mandate sentiment. Right. Right. And they consciously blurred the lines about that. There were a lot of people. I did a story about Loudoun County, Virginia, when, you know, the Republicans won the gubernatorial election there. And there were people there who were furious at the way they had been portrayed in the media. Um, as racists or anti-vaxxers, really they wanted their kids to go back to school because they had done their own research online. They found the kids weren't really right. at risk and their kids weren't learning anything. And it was a burden on them personally, right? So there's a million things like this that have added to ordinary people's 
um, dissatisfaction. And, and again, with COVID, there's the additional complicating factor of kids being involved. Like once, you know, pe people feel strongly, but once once there's something about their kids, they go. And once it, be, and it became clear pretty early on that kids were not affected, and yet they were the ones who were whose lives were most clearly upended by this, right? By lockdowns and what. Where are you on like vaccines? Are you an anti-COVID vaxxer? Are you no. anti-mandate? Are you pro-mandate, pro-vaccine or? I'm anti-mandate for yeah. sure, you know? Um, and, you know, my wife's a doctor. I'm pretty re okay. reliably convinced that vaccines have been a good thing overall in, 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 in the world. Um, I, yeah. You know, I, I yeah, I'm not a scientist. This right. is one of the reasons why I stayed away from the stories because yeah. this is not my ex area of expertise. But um, I, I do think lockdowns have been bad. Yeah. Uh, I do think the the press um, lied about the threat to kids, and I don't understand why they had to do that. Um, uh, I'm not I'm not so sure about the efficacy of va vaccinating children at all. Right. Um, you know this recent. Um, Missouri v. Biden case involves some doctors who just said some very logical things right. like if there's any risk at all with um, this vaccine, even if it's infinitesimal, it's probably more than the risk of sending your kid to school right. um, because, you know, this thing doesn't really hurt kids. And they tossed them off Twitter for that or they right. tossed them off Facebook for that. That's crazy, you know? And I think people see that as crazy. The, uh, you know, the other big story that paralleled COVID and the lockdowns obviously was George Floyd and kind of racial reckoning and whatnot. You had, it was it 2019 when you wrote the Eric Garner book? Uh, or earlier yeah, than 18, that? I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, which is a, you know, before the lockdown and things like that. But how, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the George Floyd story was huge. And it was, you know, again, it probably wouldn't have been as big if we weren't in lockdown and whatnot. But go back to Eric Garner, who was arrested for selling loose cigarettes in Staten Island and then died while the police were arresting him. Um, where, where do you think we are in terms of kind of criminal justice reform as well as race relations? Um, is, are we better than 2019 or, or you know, or, or Eric Garner time or... Is it worse or is it just kind of like an open wound that we never quite can close or heal? I don't know. I mean, I haven't spent a lot of time in the last couple of years looking at local policing. I did for many years spend a lot of time in the courts and, you know, doing sort of street reporting. The George Floyd summer was very frustrating for me personally because the big lesson that I came away from with, from the George Floyd story was that broken windows policing had massively increased the number of contacts between the ordinary citizen and police, which in turn resulted in a lot of these situations going wrong and people dying. And the one thing that's fixable in this whole milieu um, is we can change that. We can change statistics-based policing. We don't have to order people to stop you know, 20 people a month or whatever it is. And it never came up. I mean, it was it, it, it was like it was purposely excluded from the floor. It didn't coverage. seem to be serving anybody's interests, right? Right. You, it, everybody abstracted immediately to you're you're racist, you're not racist, or something. Right, because it wasn't. It it, it didn't have a tie to um, America's racist past. Uh, you, you know the inherent. Uh, tendency to, towards white supremacy. Now, there are obviously enormous racial overtones to police brutality, and I detailed a lot of them in, in you know, my book. Um, but it's only part of the picture. I mean, it's, this is just the same thing as like Trump coverage. Uh, people picked one thing, and that became the, the entire lens uh, through which they looked at that story, and they ignored all these other you know, shades of gray and complexities. Um, and, may, and I think they left audiences um, less informed than they were before uh, as a result. Um, part, I got, uh, to kind of wrap up, one of the things I find most interesting about your, your kind of post mainstream media output, uh, and you've started a, a podcast or you, where you talk with Walter Kern, the mm -hmm. novelist. And a lot of what you're doing is you're talking about stuff like, uh, you know, Mark Twain's The Man That Corrupted Hadleyburg or 
you know, classic stories, American stories, et cetera. What's the goal there and what has the response been? Part of it is just because Walter uh, Kern and I um, both like talking about books. We don't get to do it very much. We've decided to experiment. What would happen if we did that? And um, what we found is people are so tired of the relentless sort of binary nature of media these days. Team X versus Team Y, Team Blue versus Red. Um, and it's divisive, it's anti-intellectual. Um, you don't get to talk about um, anything interesting in these shows. It's always an argument, and it's a dumb argument that just never ends. And, and I mean, this was part of, uh, I mean, this is the basis of Hate Inc., your book about, what's the subtitle, Why Today's Media Make Us Hate Each Other. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think it's, it's a kind of a bad product unless you're, um, unless you have some kind of amazing breaking news that's about to come out, why would you watch it? I mean, it just makes you depressed. Uh, what we found is when we talked about these stories, we're getting into all these um, issues, and also we're also finding that a lot of these old stories that um, you know maybe dust covered in people's imaginations, they're amazingly relevant today. You know, the uh, E.M. Forster's "The Machine Stops." Um, has a lot of relevance to. Can you do culture. a quick summary? What what's the plot of that? Yeah, the plot of that. The, Ian Forster um, imagined a world where people no longer had to do anything. They lived underground. Um, machines basically did everything for them. They were t told that if they went outside, they would die immediately. Uh, there were legends about that. So, uh, but one day the machine starts to malfunction because the people who um, were, are taking care of the machine, they've started to die off. And so the thing has started to malfunction. And people slowly realize that uh, they've been had, that it's actually safe to go outside. And uh, a lot of the legends they've been um, told to keep them afraid and keep them indoors and keep them uh, from acting out on their own are, are fake. And that's very true of internet culture. I think we, you know, we're, a lot of us are captured by our neuroses now, right? We don't have as much face-to-face -face contact with people. And um, it, it, it's very relevant today, you yeah. know? And, and it was so much fun talking about that. And we got a, a great response from people who, you know, who are saying, um, there's a whole world of thought out there that they're telling us doesn't exist anymore, but it, it, it is out there, you know, and people are learning to enjoy it again. I think we're going to leave it there. Matt Taibbi, thanks for talking to Reza. Great. Thanks so much, Matt.